If you don't mind, I'm going to add a few more lines to Paul's description of love. Love is crawling under the church with a hairdryer to thaw a pipe. Love is all the calls I have received from members of this church and from folks throughout the community checking on us and on our shelter guests during the cold snap. Do any of you want to add more? Love is? Love is a warm hug from friends. A warm hug from friends. Love is everything. Love is answered prayer. Answered prayer. Love is God. Love is God. We've been focusing throughout January on how we can make this a year of growth for us, spiritual growth as individuals and as a church. And we've remembered that the baptism of the Holy Spirit and of fire was given to us to get us started on this journey of growth. And that grace gifts, spiritual gifts, have been given to provide every kind of ability that we need for growth as a community. Growing in unity and our sense of belonging and need for one another is essential in order to overcome the divisions that slow and stunt our growth. <clears throat> Last Sunday, we left this place saying to one another, I need you. We need you. Today, as we conclude this series on preparing for a year of growth, we're already a month into this year, we read again in this letter to Corinth, that church that had a lot of improving and growing to do. We know that because Paul uses that illustration in verse 11 that I read about when he was a child and he acted like a child, but growing up meant leaving behind his childish ways and adopting more mature ways. In chapter 13, Paul gets to the crux of what it is that's going to enable them to grow as Christian believers, to be what God intends them to be, and that is love. My guess is that nine times out of ten when you've heard that beautiful passage of scripture read, it's been at a wedding. Am I right? Yeah. <laughs> We associate this poetic passage with romantic love, with the love between two people who are making a loving commitment to one another that they hope will last a lifetime. But Paul didn't stick a random bit of marriage counseling in here in his letter. He is still writing to the same church in the same faith community that he was speaking to just a few verses before as he wrote about spiritual gifts and about valuing their diversity and about coming together and depending on one another in unity. And when he continues on in chapter 14, Paul will still be on that same topic, writing about how spiritual gifts should be used in worship. So this chapter on love is about love in a community, about love in a church. He ends chapter 12 saying, now I will show you the most excellent way. Or if you were to translate it more literally, I will show you a way beyond comparison. Paul is alluding to their problem which was comparing themselves to one another and finding either themselves or someone else to be lacking. We do that too. We notice how someone else needs to improve. We notice what we might lack as a church compared to other churches. Or on the other hand, we might congratulate ourselves because we think we are better than some other churches or that we are better than someone else in our church or in our community. What we need instead is a way beyond comparison. And that is the way of love. Only love 
can take us beyond measuring and comparing. And this way beyond comparison is actually a vision. It's a vision of a community living life together in the way that God created it to be, the way that God longs for us to live together with one another, and for the church to model for the world, everything else will fall into place. Everything else will flourish if we start with love, and if we seek to grow first in love. We might be the greatest at all sorts of church activities. We might be the greatest in giving or in mission projects or in inviting people in to fill our pews or studying the Bible. But if we don't love, none of that will matter, even one bit. So we're going to look carefully at what it means to love. And I say that deliberately, to love, not to have love love, as if it was a thing to obtain. The love God had, the love in this vision that Paul gives to us for Christian community is a verb, not a noun. This glorious passage about love is rooted in the understanding that love is a verb. Because starting in verse 4, Paul strings together six verbs together with the word agape, love. And we can't see that in most of our English translations. Oh, what we see when we look at it is adjectives, as if Paul is describing this thing called love. It is patient, he says. It is kind. It is full of hope. At least that's what it looks like in our English translations. And the result sounds kind of dreamy, some dreamy description of love that's sort of like this warm, fuzzy, blanky, or a soft, purring cat. And that's why it sounds so great at a wedding, because it's all soft and dreamy. But in Greek, it's possible to take a word like patience, which in English is an adjective, and make it act like a verb. <coughs> love that actively does these things. And so starting with patience, what it actually says is something like love is actually practicing patience in real situations. Like when someone makes an a mistake that upsets you, or doesn't do their part, or doesn't do something as well as you could have done it, you actually practice patience. That's love. You hold your tongue, you count to ten, you gently guide, you patiently explain it all again. That's love. Love is doing kindness, doing kind need, deeds in situations of need. Love is giving someone a ride, putting food in the food wagons at our doorways, Love is letting the stressed out young mother go ahead of you in the checkout line. Love is giving a tired cashier a word of encouragement. Love is shoveling the walk for a neighbor, doing kindness. In the message translation that I printed on the back of our bulletin, Eugene Peterson puts Paul's list of 16 verbs into concrete actions. He writes, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut. Doesn't have a swelled head. Doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first. Doesn't fly off the handle. Doesn't keep score of the sins of others doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, trusts God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. And again, I'm going to add some more. 
Love does not assume the worst, but love gives the benefit of the doubt. Love isn't in it to be noticed, but is content to keep on helping even when no one notices. Love does not make someone else the butt of a joke or laugh at someone else's expense. Love doesn't criticize another person's ideas or another person's effort. Love never issues insults. Love thinks of others first. Love cheers others on to achieve their goals. Love holds the hand of someone who is afraid. Love listens. This love is not easy or effortless. The mission of a church is not to gather together like-minded, likable people so that we can all feel good together. The church is to model a love that requires effort, a love that can be difficult, a love that can be inconvenient, a love that can be costly. The church is to grow in its ability to love the way Jesus loved. Jesus, Jesus' love brought together people from varied backgrounds. Jesus' love rescued those who thought their life was hopeless. Jesus' love knows us fully, sees everything about us, and yet loves us fully. Jesus' love put the life of every person on earth before his own and lay down his life to save us and protect us. That is the love that we must grow in this year, this week, even this day. As Paul leads out of this passage on love and begins the next chapter, he says the words, follow this way of love, pursue love. And so as we move out of this time of reflection, we move into the work of the church, which is acting out our love in community. It was welcoming a new member into our church family. It will be sharing communion around one table in remembrance of God's love. It will be enjoying being together over cake and coffee after worship. It will be joining our voices together to sing a song of love. And we're going to do that now, number 593, The Gift of Love. If you would